Let's talk about vitamin D and fertility and if you should be taking a supplement. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I am a fertility doctor. And today I wanna to talk to you about vitamin D. I know there is so much that is confusing about what vitamins and supplements you should be taking and who needs more and in what circumstance. It's also because the literature is hard. It is very hard to do nutritional studies. And if you've been around, you know that I love nutrition. I was a nutrition major and I take what I eat very seriously, but I also know how difficult it is to do some of these studies. That doesn't mean that it's not valid and that we shouldn't look at what we have and make the best guesses and the best decisions for us based on the evidence that exists. So let's dive in to vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, which is different than water-soluble. The main difference here is A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble, and what that means is that they can build up in your fat. Unlike vitamin B, where you could take an unlimited amount, you're just going to pee it out, vitamin D can build up. So there can be too much. And this is why we don't just universally go around telling people you need to intake tons of vitamin D. At the upper limit, you can have a vitamin D toxicity. However, that is much more uncommon. And reality is that you're only going to get that way from over supplementation. Vitamin D deficiency, however, is something that is quite prevalent. And we think it's at rates of up to 40% of people are vitamin D deficient. Now, if you get vitamin D toxic from over supplementing, this is typically from people who are taking extremely high levels day after day without being monitored from a doctor. But your typical symptoms can be loss of appetite, weight loss, having an irregular heartbeat, having nausea, and you can even have calcium deposits in places leading to kidney stones or even calcifications. So that's not something you want. Vitamin D deficiency, however, is something that is more common. A lot of times it's very mild symptoms. Maybe it's just fatigue. Maybe it's an increased risk of osteoporosis or bone fracture. But what we do see is certain populations have a higher tendency of being vitamin D deficient. So most of the time, this can either be from poor absorption or where you live or certain types of food restrictions. So poor absorption. So if you are have an eating disorder, if you're not eating very much, if you have an inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or you've had surgery, or you've had part of your stomach or your intestines removed, that can impair your ability to absorb this vitamin. You also see decreased levels in people who have obesity because of the distribution in the fat. So if you are overweight, you're going to have lower circulating levels that can be active. And then you have a higher risk if you're a vegan like me, if you have avoid animal-based products, if you don't supplement, if you don't spend any time in the sun. And because of the sun's impact on vitamin D, there are different levels and different ethnicities and based on where you live. As you get further away from the equator, more people have a vitamin D deficiency. Now, again, in deficiency in severe forms, you can get really bad problems with your bones. You can get rickets or osteomalacia. So those things are definitely things that have skeletal and soft tissue deformity, especially in children. And so when you're pregnant, we know you need vitamin D. That vitamin D is really important for calcium to be absorbed and for bone formation. When you're growing a human, you're growing bones. So every prenatal you're going to find out there has at least 600 to 800 international units of vitamin D. And so you need to be taking a prenatal at least three months before you conceive, both for the folic acid benefits for that neural tube, but also for the vitamin D for the skeletal bone formation. However, if you have a deficiency, you might need more. So vitamin D comes from a few main sources. You can get vitamin D from your food, as we talked about. Food sources of vitamin D in natural foods are fish, eggs, liver. If you are going to have vitamin D in fortified foods, that's how most people get their vitamin D. So that's gonna be meaning it's added. It's fortified to the food, it's not naturally there. But your grains, your cereals, your milks, and your plant-based milks all have fortified vitamin D inside of it. And then you're going to get vitamin D from supplements, which is how a lot of people get vitamin D. And then you can have vitamin D from the sun. Now, this is because you have a precursor to vitamin D in your skin, and when exposed to the sun, it can convert it into vitamin D. People who have a darker skin have a harder time absorbing the sun's rays and making this conversion. So we see higher rates of vitamin D deficiency in people with darker skin. But we also know certain things like sunscreen, which can impact the absorption of UVB rays, can also lead to higher rates of vitamin D deficiency. That being said, sunscreen is important to not get skin cancer. So you need to be careful. So it's not clear cut and just sitting in the sun's not going to get to appropriate levels for everybody. 
But as our lives have become more sedentary and indoors, we definitely see rising levels of vitamin D deficiency. Similarly, as we see increase in obesity, we're seeing rising levels of deficiency. When it comes to the supplementations that you're taking, you can take vitamin D as part of a multivitamin or in a standalone supplement. Vitamin D in most supplements is vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is made from animal precursors, usually from like lamb's wool, sheep aren't hurt in the process, but it is made from that. So if you are pure vegan and you don't wanna be consuming any animal products, you might wanna look for a vitamin D2 supplement, which is more plant-based. That said, vitamin D3 does increase your serum levels more than D2, and it is what most studies are looking at. Because of this, we don't want anybody just taking a random supplement, right? But we wanna be able to titrate levels to what you need. Every study that we're about to go through quickly has different levels of vitamin D deficiency, and that's what is confusing. Some studies use a level of 20, and some studies use a level of 30 nanograms per milliliter. Some studies use a level of 20, and some studies use a level of 30 nanomoles per liter. So this is confusing because it's hard to compare based on different levels. All right, so if we look at general population levels, when you look at fertility-based studies, you can look at studies associated with fecundability, natural pregnancy rates, pregnancy loss. You can look at IVF studies, which are a little more controlled. And then you can look at fertility-related conditions or submarkers like AMH or ovarian reserve, PCOS, endometriosis, and male infertility. The take-home message is a lot of the studies have been mixed, but looking at most population-based studies, we're not seeing different conception rates in populations with vitamin D deficiency or not, meaning it's unlikely to be something strongly correlated with natural fertility overall in everybody. That said, it might be in certain subgroups when you break it down to certain regions or to certain medical conditions, vitamin D might become more important. When we look at IVF studies, which are more controlled, we do have some studies that do show a significant improvement in live birth rates in people who are vitamin D replete or have normal levels versus people who have low levels. And so these studies usually use the number of 20 nanomoles per liter as their break point. And in clinical practice, most people use 30, which is endocrine society recommendations as a goal, but you'll see a lot of people permit you to proceed if you're in the 20s and not hold your cycle. But if you're lower than 20, you might have somebody say they're not going to do a transfer until you get here. We know that vitamin D receptor plays a role in the ovaries, the placenta, and the endometrium and the uterus. So it's definitely active in some way. We've not seen an improvement in egg quality associated with vitamin D levels, although that's it's something that's hard to study. We do know that people who had higher levels of vitamin D in their follicular fluid, meaning inside the follicle, had a higher chance of getting pregnant, but they didn't have better embryo quality on any metrics that we had. So it might not be directly correlated with egg quality, although it might represent overall that they had higher chances of pregnancy. This leads us to the likely impact of vitamin D being on the uterus or with implantation and why we worry about it a lot when it comes to embryo transfer. IVF studies and some egg donor studies. We think about egg donor studies as the creme de la creme because you're naturalizing for egg quality and you're really separating it since the eggs came from a different source and you're really looking at just the impact of the body on transfer. And in donor recipient cycles, when the recipient or the intended parent or the person who was having a transfer had lower levels of vitamin D, they had lower pregnancy rates. We saw that some in autologous IVF studies too. Now, replicated studies haven't always shown the same thing. Some have shown no benefit, some have shown benefit. There hasn't been anything showing true harm from supplementing or repleting vitamin D. And so therefore, because of possible benefit and lack of harm, at these levels, trying to shoot for a vitamin D of greater than 20 or greater than 30 nanomoles per liter prior to an embryo transfer makes sense. And that's why fertility clinics started checking vitamin D, seeing how patients were, because such a high prevalence of the population did have vitamin D deficiency. When you look at endometriosis and PCOS, vitamin D can be anti-inflammatory and vitamin D can be really just overall important and part of the immune system. It looks like in PCOS, a study did show no change in metabolic markers when repleted or supplemented with vitamin D. However, a subsequent study of patients with PCOS who underwent IVF, who had normalized their vitamin D levels, had higher pregnancy rates than people who did not. We also saw a change in ovarian reserve, meaning the AMH dropped in certain PCOS patients who were supplemented with vitamin D, meaning they might be normalizing how many eggs are released or having a higher tendency to ovulate, even though that hasn't been 
seen directly. Vitamin D and AMH, we have not had consistent data that vitamin D is impacting your ovarian reserve. Similarly, we haven't seen data that vitamin D is improving your endometriosis from a pain or a subjective standpoint. Remember that it's very hard to go and study endometriosis. It's a surgical diagnosis and that's how you track it. But it might be beneficial when it comes to that uterus still for implantation rates. We also don't know about vitamin D and male fertility. There have been some studies suggesting an improvement in sperm and some studies suggesting no change in sperm in somebody who's vitamin D deficient or who has it replaced. The take home when you look at all of this data together is that vitamin D appears to be extremely important when you're pregnant, we know that. We wanna have normal vitamin D levels. And so vitamin D, you should be taking a prenatal at least three months before you get pregnant. If you have a vitamin D deficiency, we should shoot to get those vitamin D levels as close to 30 or over as we can for possible benefit without harm. For most people, this is going to be taking an additional one or 2,000 international units a day. It looks like the upper limit you can take without risking going into that toxic zone is about four to 5,000 a day. Sometimes people will give you higher to try to get you up if your vitamin D is extremely low, but do that with a doctor, not on your own. It's reasonable to think that vitamin D might impact implantation in some way based on the data that we have. So I wouldn't hold somebody's IVF cycle, but I would hold their transfer to get to a level of 20 or higher. If you don't know what your vitamin D is, you can ask to get it checked. Supplementation overall is relatively easy. Remember that most of the time you can supplement with either D2 or D3, most of us are supplementing patients with D3 because it gets to those serum levels higher. But if you want to avoid everything animal-based, ask about D2 supplementation. When it comes to vitamins and supplements, a prenatal every day is gonna cover your basic bet. And I do have video all about prenatal vitamins. If you're vitamin D deficient, add on an extra vitamin D because so many patients are, I usually recommend all of my patients take an extra 1,000 international units of vitamin D because at that dose, it's not going to cause harm and will benefit certain populations of people. Hope this video helped break down vitamin D just a little bit for you. Overall, please ask any questions you have about your fertility. Thanks for being here. Click to follow along and subscribe. You can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks, friends.